Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks on Saturday, October 5th, 2013. This is episode 1019. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, or other Apple product is worth at gazelle.com. I am Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tech Guy Show once again. Another weekend ahead where we talk about computers and the Internet and smartphones and home theaters, digital photography, and all that jazz. Heather Hammond, the phone ranger, is here. You'll be calling her. She'll be saying, hello. You, you, don't, you don't have a special operator voice you use, do you? <laughs> No, one ringy thing. But people still ask, they go, is this Heather? Is this H-Bomb? I'm like, well, yeah. You become a celebrity. <laughs> we were so lucky to get Heather. She worked for uh, many years with Dr. 11 years with Dr. Dina Dell, uh, answering medical questions. Did you ever get on the air like you, you get on the air oh, with me? a ton. Yeah, yeah, Dean, you see, people don't understand. <laughs> Being a talk show host is lonely. It's a lonely business. We sit here in an empty room with padded walls. I literally work in a room with padded walls. <laughs> and so if there's somebody on the other side of the glass, you're going to talk to them. You're going to talk to them. That's one of the things I love about uh, the Internet is that you have the appearance of social relationships with people all the time. You may not know anybody. But at least you think you do. <laughs> do you, you have 424 friends on right. Facebook? Do you think that that takes... This is a very important question. I think a lot of people are wondering. Do you think that takes the place of real friends? How much of... You You probably have a lot of friends on Facebook, right? Right. How much of, of that do you think takes the place of actual relationships? Or is it... You know, there's a, <laughs> there's a sugar substitute out there. <laughs> it tastes just like sugar. Right, it's a okay. sugar alcohol, and it's great for your teeth. You know why? Because it fools the bacteria that cause cavities. They think they're eating sugar. There's no nutrition in it, and they die. Oh my God! I think that the I think the Facebook is is the xylitol of <gasps> of of real life. You think you have real friends, and then you die of loneliness because you have uh. these people. They don't know you. You're uh, bits to them. What do you think? Oh my God! I don't know what to say. I mean, there's Facebook. And no, everybody's this. looking at me. We're looking at a studio audience and going, "No, you're wrong, Leo. Those are real friends. Yeah, they're your high school friends, people you knew in high school, your family members. I look at my kids. Uh, my son, before he went to college, met his roommate. Guy had a relationship with uh, the guy all summer. His roommate lives in London, England. See, they would not have been perfect. able to meet him ahead of time. Yeah, that's very cool. But then there's he's gonna people. meet him. Yeah. Oh, and they'll either be they'll actually have a real well, but they'll have at least a real relationship. It's so interesting because I find that people that I used to like are really annoying on Facebook, and you turn them down as you are able to kind of do see less of them. I really wish I could quit Facebook. <laughs> I wish I could. I can't. You can for a lot of reasons. I'm kind of hooked on it. Are you? Yeah. I'm like that little dental bacteria. I just think I'm. I think it's just a. Mmm, that's good nutritious <laughs> friends. I'll tell you. It's a itch I don't need to scratch anymore. <laughs> I would yeah, I'm really and it's funny because you talk to people about Facebook and it's it's one of those things people love to hate, you know. They 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 do it, they use it, but there's this kind of mixed feelings about it. Is that not is that not the case? It seems to me I it is. I think so. Yeah. It's a little addictive and then you might get on it and you feel guilty, just like, Oh my god, here I am putting this needle in my arm again. I know I shouldn't do that, but here I am wasting time. There's a new short film that just showed at the Toronto Film Festival called Noah. And it was uh, made by two uh college kids. It's an it's an interesting story. Um I don't know if you'll be able to see it. It's not Noah and the Ark, by the way. <laughs> no one. Oh. It's, uh, it's, let me see if I can find the, the story here. I just read about it this morning. Um, it's, it was uh, created by two uh, college kids who, um, let me 
me see if I can find it, who were writing about the pain of Facebook era dating. So, um, oh. yeah, Walter Woodman and Patrick Cedarberg. The movie, and it's not a long movie. I think it's a 20-minute movie. It's not a full-length <laughs> movie. Um, focuses on a teenager's computer screen. And it follows his digital life as he chats on Facebook, talks on Skype with his girlfriend, looks at adult content. It's, <laughs> it's honest, right? And uh, But doesn't really have a real life and what they said is this this we we he seeks friends through chat roulette and these guys who just got out of college a year ago said really this comes out of our own experience of having these phony relationships with people hmm. um and that when we got lonely we would go into chat roulette or somewhere and feel like we knew somebody even though we didn't so uh this is getting a lot of attention. I think a lot of people are looking at this yeah. and going, wow, this is, this is very, uh, very real. You can watch it on YouTube if you want to see. It's called uh, Noah Short. And I think it raises interesting, uh, re interesting issues about, well, exactly what I was saying. Is, is our social networks, our social media the same as real? And does it not fool our brain into thinking we have friends when, in fact, we don't? Uh-huh. And makes it, it take... Likes Somebody like this guy. If you were a little antisocial, a little shy, or whatever. Well, when someone likes your comment or your content, yeah, doesn't or whatever, that feel like somebody... you get that little dopamine yeah. squirt? Yeah, I liked. It's yeah. so little though. It's not enough. It's not like a big hug. <laughs> I just, I feels like this is there's some truth to this that this is faux relationship. Cool. I don't know. All right. So the little documentary itself unearths. Yeah, I just, or you know, it's question. worth it's worth watching because I think it, it does raise these issues. And this is young people. There, uh, somebody in the chat room just sent me a link to, this is called the online disinhibition effect. Oh. It's well known that people say and do things in cyberspace they wouldn't normally do they in the face-to-face world. Yeah. <laughs> well, even if you don't, you just feel like, well, you know, it's I'm a little, you can be a little more uninhibited. Express it's yourself. Wild West. <laughs> it's called disinhibition effect. It's a double-edged sword, though, because sometimes people say things very personal about themselves that they would never say. Then um, sometimes people do things, kind things, nice things that they would probably not do either, right? So this is an interesting... Uh, this is from um, Ryder University. There's quite a few, quite a few of these uh, psychological discussions here you don't know me which is called disassociative anonymity you, I, that's self-explanatory right you can't see me invisibility see you later asynchronicity people don't interact in real time like we are having a conversation you leave a message on a message board you come back and you see a response to that it goes back and forth not in real time <coughs> solipsistic introjection i don't know what that is <laughs> <laughs> Cyclops, what? Huh, what? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not one of those people who's, you know, I, I, you, you see this some sensationalist inter, internet uh, addicts and all this stuff. No, I, you know. But on the other hand, you do see people wandering around. There's another short film a young woman made because she was so mad that everywhere she went, people were staring at their smartphones all the time. Right. And she made a, a, a short film which has been everywhere on the internet. It's become a viral film about, you know, her boyfriend, you know, she's, she's stretching in the morning. She's looking great. Her boyfriend's looking at his phone, talking on his <laughs> phone. She goes to meet friends at the bar. They're all on their phones. Uh, this is the tragic one. Birthday party. Everybody's got their phone out recording as the cake comes out and the person blows out the candle, including the person blowing out the candle. Ooh. There's a scene on the beach <laughs> where a guy's on his knees proposing to a girl. It's such a romantic moment. But, of course, what does he have? His... His camera phone out there because he's recording. And I don't blame him. It's kind of a once-in-a-lifetime thing. You want to record this, but it does take you a little bit out of the picture. because he's it to mom and dad. Yeah. <laughs> he's proposing to her, but he's holding his camera phone out at the same time. The, the woman who stars in it uh, is in the video is actually the woman who made the video. And it was kind of in response to the fact that she's surrounded all the time by people who are just not there. I hope you're here. We're going to talk. Real people having real conversations about real technology topics. In just a moment, right here, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
And Heather Hummon is the phone answerer. We don't have a really good... What, didn't we have a name for you at one point? Yeah, Phone Ranger. The Phone Ranger. <laughs> when you call 8888, ask Leo. She answers the phone. And you are going to pick a wonderful caller to start us off today. We're going to go across the great big pond to no. Jack in Liverpool. Really? Yes. That is super cool. <laughs> Hello, Jack Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thank you, Heather. Hey, Jack, how are you? Oh, yeah, you okay. Great to talk to you. How are things in Liverpool? Uh, not too bad. Since the Beatles left, really. it's been slow? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, just teasing you. Actually, our very, very good friend, Don McAllister, is a Liverpudlian. He is the he guy is, who does yeah. screencasts online. You see him around from time to time? No, I've never seen him, but um, I know he's a regular in the Apple store, the local yeah, Apple store. Yeah, we love him. He is just great. Well, what can, what can I do for you today, Jack? Yeah, well, basically, I've got an uh, iPhone 5, and I'm looking to maybe get an Android phone. So I was wondering, you know, a top-end one, I was wondering what sort of recommendations do you have? Do you think the HTC One or the S4 would be better or... You know, you know, it's a, it's the, the the thing that's happened here with smartphones is it's it's is that choice has now uh, proliferated to such a degree. In 2007, when the iPhone came out, there was nothing. In fact, 2008, 2009, there was nothing. I got the first Android phone, which was an HTC. It was the G1. Played with it for a little bit. We were very excited because we thought, oh, what's Google going to do? It was so horrible. There still was nothing. There was one choice and one choice only, and that was Apple's iPhone. Well, fast forward to this fall and my goodness it is a crowded market and i think it's great what it means is there's a lot of choice and there isn't a right answer for everybody you know if you'd call jack and said you know in 2007 what's the smartphone to get i'd say obviously an iphone uh because it was such a, a huge advance but people have copied apple people have learned from apple in some cases people have even leapfrogged apple so the the answer to your question really varies on you I'll give you some good choices. The probably, I would say, arguably the top of the line Android phone out right now is probably the HTC One. Still, it's getting a little long a tooth. Why it's four months old now? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's so old. But uh, here's a couple of things it does better than the iPhone. It has stereo front facing speakers. So if you ever listen to the music or speech, I listen to audiobooks. On the phone, having front-facing speakers this is the only phone, to my knowledge, that does this. That's fabulous, and it, you know, it's Beats. It's so it's not, you know, I mean, it Beats is, is supposedly, you know, a special, but it's not. I don't find it particularly audio fidelic, fidelic, or whatever the word would be. But you yeah. know, front-facing speakers do make a difference, left and right. Uh, it also has. Uh, arguably the best screen out there. Certainly one of the best, if not the best. It is a, a 1080p screen. 4.7 inches means it's not too huge. But some people want huge. The Note 3 uh, just came out, the Galaxy Note 3. That is also 1080p, but in a much bigger uh, screen, uh, over 6 inches. Or no, not quite 6 inches, but getting getting darn close. Um, so there's so many choices right now. I think the new iPhone is a very compelling choice. If you are, You're currently an iPhone user, right? Yeah, but I'm not a fan of iOS 7, to be honest. I'm not either. Um, I think Apple's doing some interesting stuff with it, but I don't, I'm not crazy about how it looks, so I'm, I'm with you on that one. I think I feel that like Apple, um, Apple is, is kind of in a little bit of a tough space right now. They call it the innovator's dilemma. Being very, very successful it takes its toll in the tech industry because you need to continue to do the thing that made you successful so it's very hard to reinvent yourself and apple is such a success with the iphone they can't change it too rapidly meanwhile they're being danced around by companies like HTC, who frankly are this close to going out of business and they can try all sorts of stuff so they're doing great innovations the one to me is a very is similar to the iphone it's unibody aluminum doesn't have a fingerprint reader. I don't know if that makes much difference at all, frankly. Um, does have a great screen. Possibly, uh, I would say, arguably better than the iPhone screen. Camera. Now, that's an interesting one. I don't think... The HTC One has this 4-megapixel camera that they're kind of touting how good it does, in how well it does in low light, and it does. But it's not, in my opinion, the best camera out there. Um, you know what I like uh, for iPhone users? And certainly... Now, unfortunately, you can't get this in the UK. So this isn't for you, Jack. But I'm a big fan of the Moto X. I think that in the for United States and I guess uh, the Americas, 
Uh, iPhone fans should absolutely look at the Moto X. I think in many respects, it has the charm and the feel of an iPhone, the elegance of an iPhone, but it's a little bit more advanced in some areas. But there isn't a... I wish... I, you know, the times have changed enough now, Jack. There isn't a right answer. There's not, oh, you know, just go out and get the BlackBerry Q. You know, it's not that way. Uh, you really need to go to your local uh, phone store. You need to hold them, try them. In my opinion, the best hand feel, I know that seems like a strange and it's very subjective, but the best hand feel is the Moto X. The best screen is probably the HTC One. The best sound is the HTC One. That's that's a no question about it. The biggest nice screen is the Galaxy Note 3. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. You can wear a watch, the Galaxy Watch with that. They call it the gear. Uh, and it ties in with it, and that's kind of interesting. I think the iPhone is still a compelling product, absolutely. There's lots of people who will buy the iPhone. It probably will, at least in the U.S., continue to be the best-selling phone, smartphone out there. And I think that's for good reason. It's a quality product, beautifully made. Apple is gradually improving and adding to its capabilities in a nice way. Nice camera now. Fingerprint reader. Uh, there are things under the hood in iOS 7 that make it very, very sophisticated. It has a, a physics particle engine, which means you can do really amazing graphics on it. You notice when you, t when you turn the iPhone, the new iPhone, and, uh, and, and the background moves in parallax as you turn it, things like that are <laughs> kind of mind-boggling. Are they useful? No. But they're <laughs> pretty impressive looking. Um, it, the other reason to stick with an iPhone, and this is, I, in my opinion, this is what Apple's relying on is their ecosystem. If you've got a lot of money invested in a Apple apps, you know, I, apps from the App Store, uh, in uh, iTunes Music, iTunes Video, iTunes TV and Movies, then, is, you know, there, there's a certain amount of lock-in. If you, you know, use iTunes on the desktop. But I've there's never been a better time to buy an Android phone. There's never been better choices. Even the Windows phones are pretty amazing right now. The Lumia 1020, that's a very popular phone in the UK. I think it's one of the top two or three phones in the UK. That's an excellent choice with the best camera, arguably the best camera out there. You can see I'm not helping you at all. But <laughs> I would go out and I would look and, and see, see what you see and uh, you know feel it in your hands. It's such a personal decision. People are surprised when I say that my day-to-day my -day phone now is the Moto X uh, because they say, but it's so middle of the road, you know, it's kind of a, not the best screen, not the best camera, not the best anything. But all put together, it, it for some reason, to me, it just feels the best. I just like the features of it. It's really tricksy. Kick the tires, Jab says in our chat room. I agree 100%. Hey, it's nice to know you're listening in Liverpool. That's It's wonderful. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate the call. More calls to come. Our website, techguylabs.com. That's the place to go if you want to get links to all of the things that we talk about on the show. You can comment, too, and I appreciate it if you do that. It adds to the value of the website. Always free, no subscription charge. Techguylabs.com. I am Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. I am Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Each and every week at this time, our home theater guru joins us, Scott Wilkinson, host of the Home Theater Geeks podcast on my network, twit.tv, and... Editorial director at the AVS Forum and a guy who just loves great audio and great video and uh, talks about it all the time. So uh, we, we've mentioned a couple of times that I bought this crazy OLED TV from Samsung. And it's not as, you've seen it now, it's not as curved as you might think. It's 5% curvature, but it's in a larger frame that's more curved, so the general appearance is curved. Yeah. And uh, people have asked me, well, you know, why is it curved? And <laughs> all I can say is, well, A, I don't know. And B, well, it's one way of distinguishing the TV from others. And mm -hmm. C, because they can. One of the features of OLED is it can be flexible. Yep. Yep. Well, all of those are true. But is, is there any real advantage to having a 5% curvature? Uh, to tell you the truth, I don't think so. I have actually asked Samsung this question, and they have said to me, officially, uh, essentially, because we can. Yeah. And, be, and that, they, to, you can't do that with an LCD panel. No, you can't. Well, that's actually not true. Can that's you? That's actually not true. At the recent IFA show in Germany, Sony showed a... It's, it wasn't at IFA. It was at a press event in New York. My mistake. They sh actually showed a curved LCD oh, TV. Right. I thought it was just because the way uh, OLED is made, it's... It could it's be deposited on a yeah. curved surface. LED it's, is a glass panel and... Yep. 
Yeah, I but they, Sony computer. actually showed it, uh, yeah. and it was a uh, larger screen. It was a 65-inch, as I recall. And so the, the question really becomes, well, why? Well, because we can isn't really a good answer. To distinguish it from other products is what Samsung it really It looks said. cool. I mean, it looks like it's floating in this frame, for one thing. Yeah. And then yeah. It's, it's kind of this curvature makes it look different, uh, makes it look very modern. Uh, I guess you could argue maybe it helps with some reflections. Actually, I would argue the opposite because I've seen photographs of this curved curved OLED in which reflections of lights from the room oh. are not points, but they're rather stretched out <laughs> smears. Oh, that would make sense, yeah. So it actually That's makes it worse. Yeah. Um, I watch mine in a pretty dark room. There's no lights on, on my which, side. Which is the way you should do it. Yeah. And the other thing about the curved screen is that it really uh, facilitates one person sitting in the perfect sweet There's spot. A sweet spot, yeah. There is. If you sit at the at right in the center, you get a much more immersive experience right. because you know it sort of fills your peripheral vision a little better. And so this may be one reason why they do it, but it it's counterintuitive. It's it it doesn't with with audio files, many audio files sit in one sweet spot between two speakers and they listen to music. And that's been a long-standing tradition in audiophilia. But in home theater, the experience is much more intended to be shared. Yeah. Well, so the good news is it's only 5%. It's such a small curvature. It doesn't really make that much difference. Well, that's true. And plus the fact that as you go off axis, the, the picture quality does not degrade. That's one of the nice things about OLED. It has a very wide angle of viewing. Right, exactly. Really, really Unlike nice. LCD, all LCDs have this problem to one extent or another. Right. That as you move off from the center, the blacks rise, the colors shift, it starts looking washed out and weird. So OLED does not have this problem. The only problem with the curved screen I can see by moving off axis is that the geometry of the picture looks a little strange, right? I because guess. you're looking off... You know, yeah, it's such a small curve again. But it's a small curve, it's a tiny yeah. curvature. Yeah, I, th you know, and they, the one thing they said is it's more immersive. I don't, you know, it's not like your head's in a bubble or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like coming around behind you. Right, um, right. I, but I think they could have eliminated it. However, when you see it, you know, I'm looking at something a little uh, different, right? Yes, yes, yeah. you do. Yeah, you yeah. do. That's and exactly. I, ha and I have to say, uh, and you will have this experience soon. It is gorgeous. gorgeous. There's nothing like it. There's yeah. nothing like it. OLED. Well, we saw it at CES. That's right. You're not. You're not. Yeah. Exactly. No, I've yeah. seen it before. Yeah. O OLED it distinguishes itself because the the little the little uh, the material that they use that they actually sort of inkjet print onto a substrate uh, either glows red, blue, or green, or some other color sometimes white uh, when you stimulate it with electricity, and that's how they they get the uh, image on the screen. It's what's called self-emissive. So the material itself glows as you stimulate it with more or less electricity, as opposed to an LCD TV, which um, there's white light passing through these tiny little shutters, which then have red, green, or blue filters in front of them. And the shutters let more or less of this light through. They can't shut off entirely, so the black levels are never perfect. On an OLED, you stop feeding it electricity, it's black. And you've seen this, clearly. Yeah. Oh, it, you just, uh, you, it feels super hyper-realistic. There's another advantage. You know I'm not a big fan of... Of uh, of 3D television. I know. There is another advantage to this. This screen is brighter than your average screen. Yep. So uh, when I, when the th when I put on the 3D glasses, which normally would cut the the brightness in half, right? Yeah, at um, least more than half for the active glasses. Th it turns up the screen, and so you don't see that dimming. Uh, right. It's a very bright screen, and so in fact, 3D looks. I hate to admit it. <laughs> it's pretty good. I kind of, it's kind of good. I kind of like it. It's I got to tell you, do you do you have Life of Pi Blu-ray? No, and I haven't seen it yet. 3D? Should I get that Blu-ray 3D? Oh, All right, I will get oh that my one. God. The flying fish come right at you. The flying fish come right at you. <laughs> the 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 whale that that the breaches out. I of the watched water. The Hobbit. I have The Hobbit 3D, and that which that is wonderful. Pretty good too. Yeah, pretty good. But, but my my two favorite movies in 3D are Life of Pi and Hugo. Oh, okay. I'll get both. So I saw Hugo in 3D at the theater. 
So I have some idea uh, about that. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I think this TV is 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 so much better in in general that even I, who hate 3D, <laughs> can can actually tolerate it. Uh, now I don't remember if the Samsung is is one that does this or if it's the LG. I think it's the Samsung where it, you can use those 3D glasses not only to watch 3D content, but you can also watch one one person can watch one show while another person watches a different show on the same screen yeah it's called multi-view it is the samsung multi-view it is the samsung yeah. okay and it, each of the headphone each of the uh, 3d glasses have their own earphones so that they can hear different show you know i haven't right. used that yet <laughs> <laughs> but the ultimate in in togetherness yet yeah, isolated <laughs> i want to watch the same show as my honey at the same time. One thing I do wonder about OLEDs, uh, one of the reasons OLEDs have been slow to market is there's been some concern about the, the blue or purple uh, pigment the, fading. The blue pigment, yes, exactly, exactly. And, and do we know if they've solved that? I, we don't, for sure. The, there's only one way to I'll know. I'll find out. You're going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, when I was at Tech TV back in the, the late 90s, we bought very early plasma TVs. Very expensive. Yes. I think they were $15,000 for Oh, sure, 40, for like a 40, 40 yeah, yeah, 42. Yeah, and they exactly. got, all of them got very dim within about five years. They were yep. so washed out as to be un, unwatchable. Plus, you had image retention. Bad problem. image burn-in. Bad. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. O OLED... We do have some concern, particularly about the blue material, the blue OLED material that... Uh, so I'm taking will... a big chance here because you I'll are. tell you, those HDTVs we bought at Tech TV in 1998 were unusable by 2003. I mean, literally, they were good <laughs> for the lobby. You know, they were just terrible. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But that, now that's been solved in uh, plasma. So you don't Absolutely. ever want to be the first to buy anything like this. Well, except when you're geeks like us. <laughs> <laughs> I am taking the hit, so you don't have no, to. No, you don't have to. Yeah, right, exactly. I'm using, I'll let you know if there's any fading. But meanwhile, man, the Niners look good on that screen. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I got to tell you. Hey, Scott Wilkinson is our home theater geek. You can listen to his show or watch it live at twit.tv uh, every Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern time, or download it after the fact, twit.tv slash HTG for home theater geeks. Catch them at the AVS Forum as well, avsforum.com. Thanks, Scott. You bet. We'll talk next week. Now we continue on with your calls. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Talking about uh, all sorts of stuff. Of course, home theater and all that jazz. Uh, let's get back to the phones. Who's next here? Uh, Charlie in Hopatapatakataka. Where are you calling from, Charlie? I live in Hopatcong, New Jersey. Hopatcong. Yeah, northern yeah. New Jersey. Northern, beautiful area. Is that a, uh, is that an Indian name? Yeah, yes it is. All right. The, the Lanai Lenape were very, you know, filling the whole northern New Jersey area. All right. That's cool. That's cool. Well, what can I do for you? Nice to have you. Thank you, Charlie. Hey, thanks. Uh, uh, Longtime fan and uh, just wanted to give you a quick question here. Um, Thank you. I've been, I want to get like a Nexus Seven. I'm, I'm going to buy the Nexus Seven. This and is the uh, new tablet figure... from uh, Google. Two hundred twenty-nine bucks, but it's gorgeous. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out where to buy it from. Uh, you know, you can go to Best Buy. You can go to Staples. I don't think that you matters. Can buy it directly, directly from Google. Yeah. Is there is there like a better place for like warranty coverage? I hear that when you buy it directly from Google, like if you have something wrong with it, you send it to Google. Basically, exchange it. Yeah. Or or do you have to send it in? You send it in because there's nowhere you can't. There's no Google Store down the road. Um, hmm. I don't know if it matters that much. Now it, it's interesting because a, a number of people have complained about issues with an Nexus Seven. Um, some touch screen issues, rebooting or black screen issues. Consumer Reports even downgraded it a little bit, saying we don't recommend it until they solve these problems. And then later said, Ah, they've solved the problems. I had never had any problems with my Nexus 7. I bought one of the first ones that came out. Uh, Lisa over here bought one, and she's had it for a while and loves it. So I don't anticipate a lot of problems. And at 229 bucks, boy, it's a great deal. Gorgeous uh, 1080p screen. I guess if you're going to buy it, uh, you know, you're buying it at list price from Google. You may be able to get a better deal if you shop around. Eventually, there are going to be, as it's, uh, uh, somebody in the chat room says, there are going to be Google stores and Best Buys, but I don't think they exist yet. Um, 
I I don't know if it makes that much difference. Pro you know, I got it from Google. I guess that would be the, I mean, that's the company that's most likely to stand behind it. That's It's got their name on it. So in that case, I think probably better off. What are you going to do with it? Um, I don't really have a, a PC at home that I use. Um, so it's just going to be for, like, browsing, you know, laying on the couch. Yeah, Netflix, it's great for that. A little bit here and there. It's actually a great gaming device. There's a lot of, more and more of their great games on Android, and it really is just the right size. You can hold it in one hand. It's really a good choice. Uh, if you you know if you get that get the Chrome get it from Google and get the Chromecast for thirty five bucks I think they're now in stock. That's the little uh, HDMI dongle you put in your TV and then you can use the Nexus Seven tablet or any Android device for that matter to uh, search for movies on Netflix, to uh, search for music on Pandora, to search for music on Google Play Music, and then and then tell the Chromecast attached to your TV play this. And it's a great it's a great way. Uh, to watch TV, I, I more and more because of that. When I look at there are different places, you know, you can buy a TV show. I, there's a new BBC TV show that uh, somebody turned me on to called Orphan Black, and you could probably buy you could buy it on iTunes, you could buy it at Amazon, or you can buy it on Google Play. And I bought it on Google Play because of the convenience of being able to fire it up on my phone or my Nexus Seven, and then having it and telling the TV play this, and then you continue on. Uh, you continue on with you, whatever you're doing on the tablet. You can even turn off the tablet and the t because the TV is taken over. The Chromecast is taken over. It's really kind of cool. And as they add new stuff, and I'm sure that other companies are going to come along and add capabilities to Chromecast, it will it will be uh, very cool, get even cooler. Uh, th hey, thanks for the call. I think you're going to enjoy that Nexus Seven. Let me know uh, how it works. Lisa, you haven't had any trouble with your Nexus 7, right? You like it. Love it. Never been a problem. It's a, it's a good choice. Yeah. I like it a lot. Uh, Charlie in... Oh, no, that was Charlie. Let's go to Matt Hillsboro. Is that California? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Matt. Hello? Hello. Hi, Leo. Hey. How you doing? This is, this is Matt from New Jersey. Well, oh, from New Jersey. Hillsboro, New Jersey. Yeah, it's Jersey Day on uh, the Tech Jersey Guy Day. Show. Yeah, <laughs> New Jerky. New Jerky. Hey, how you doing? Are you near Hopatakalakapong? No, actually, I'm from a town called Piscataway, right in the middle. Oh, of I know where Piscataway. It says Hillsboro on here. Piscataway. Yeah, I, I know where that is. Yeah, I, I live in Hillsboro, but I'm oh, okay. From I'm a I'm a I'm a Jersey boy. You know, my my parents uh, met and married in Leonia, New Jersey, and uh, there I, you go. I yeah, so I spent a lot of time in Jersey. What can I do for gotta you? Love, gotta love Jersey. Hey, I, I love any, Jersey. Uh, People get, you know, the Sopranos ruin New Jersey. It makes everybody think Jersey's just full of mafiosi and, and, and industrial plants. Uh, and, Jer Jer Jersey was already ruined. They <laughs> <laughs> it's the Garden State, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and then there was Jersey Shore, which has really messed things up. Uh, don't, don't, don't even start with me. Get out of here. Forget about it. <laughs> what, can I, what can I do for you? Hey, I got about a uh, seven or eight month old uh, Lenovo IdeaPad. Okay. Um, it came. Uh, it's the P five hundred. As far as I know, it was only available through Best Buy. All right. Um, what I would like to do is take out the CD um, drive, the CD rewritable drive, and install a Blu-ray drive. Um, wow, that's an interesting project. As, as far as I know, there are other Idea Pads with the same chassis. That came with Blu-ray players? Ah, then that's encouraging. That means you could probably go on eBay and buy a, the part. Yeah, and, and provided I could find one that fits, right. is it just a plug-and-play thing, or do I need to install mm. drivers? Because Blu-ray has is really uh, copy-protected uh, considerably, <laughs> uh, I, yeah. I, think, I believe Steve Jobs called it a bag of hurt. Uh, that's why Apple's never shipped hardware with Blu-ray built in. So it, it is plug-and-play in some respects, plug-and-play in the respect that Hardware wise, it is. But if you wanted to play a Blu ray disc, or I mean, if you wanted to use it as a Blu ray thing, uh, you're going to have to have some software. You're using Windows, though, right? Yeah, Windows 8. Windows 8 has support for Blu ray built in. It may not be that complicated. Uh, the more complicated thing, and the thing that concerns me more, is how do you open that laptop? How do you get the, the player in there? Getting the player that dis really does fit, and so forth and so on. Yeah, as far as I know, once you open up the drive, there's a little tab that you hit, and the whole drive pops up. Uh, that's awesome. 
We'll try that. <laughs> I've done, you know what I uh, I did with uh, another laptop, an Apple laptop. I opened it up, took out the uh, the CD DVD player and put in a solid state drive. And that was a pretty easy thing to do. So a lot of times they are, you are able to get to the hardware and replace it. That wasn't so hard to do. Yeah, really, I'm really happy with the Lenovo. Which they make great product. I'm, I'm just trying to think, you, you know, yeah, the window, Windows 8 will support the, you know, the, the trick is this high, high def copy protection, HDCP, that Blu-ray requires. Did do you want to play Blu-ray movies on it? Um, yeah, I mean, no, it's, it's just, so that you know, won't work without HDCP support. And that has to go. It has to be in the operating system, has to be in the Blu-ray player, but also has to be in the screen in the connectors and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. My guess. Yeah, my guess is. Because Lenovo sells, a, they sell. It's a, it's an identical model except it has a Blu-ray player. It's like an option. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't have my computer in front of me. I, I would look around and see if anybody's done this first, just to make sure. Okay. Uh, the Win Windows 8 is going to be able to do it, uh, not natively, but you get a Blu-ray playing program. Windows 8 is HDCP compliant. Yeah. Uh, you uh, so you, I don't know. You might need Media Center. They're saying in the chat room that might be. Uh, you you definitely need some Blu-ray player software, but you can buy that third-party software. I think Windows 8 is going to support the copy protection. I don't know if that's going to be an issue, but I do wonder about the hardware. That might be a little bit tricky. The thank you can thank the movie industry for this. They're very paranoid. They feel they made a mistake with uh, DVDs because <laughs> you remember DVDs are cracked within months of their first release by a high school student from Norway. Uh, <laughs> He just he said, you know, I think I can crack this. And uh, ever since, because the, the way they designed this, they couldn't change it. You know, it would if they changed the format of DVDs, every DVD player in existence would stop working. So they were stuck with it. They're still stuck with it. So when it came time to design Blu-ray, there were actually two competing standards. There was HD, DVD, and Blu-ray. But in both cases, the movie industry said, you will never see this. You will never see movies on Blu-ray unless Sony, which designed Blu-ray, unless Sony, you provide a really strong way to copy protect this. And uh, and so as a result, it's tricksy. They, they, they made it, you know, they don't want you just kind of doing that what you're doing, frankly. They want you to be all certified and buttoned up. So I can't promise. It's worth a try, though. Look and see if anybody else has done it. That's the beauty of the Internet. And uh, Keith in the chat room saying, you know, you can buy external USB 3 uh, Blu-ray players. That might, might be a little bit easier. Just play it over the USB. All right, we're going to take a break for the news at the top of the hour, but there's more to come. Stay here. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. I hope you're enjoying our uh, Tech Guy show. Yes, I know. Many of you have been paying close attention, realize that I am, in fact, not here. I am uh, I'm on vacation, but we recorded all new material for you, all new content, new calls and everything. I hope you're enjoying it. And I do thank our sponsor, Gazelle. Boy, are they a great company. In fact, this is a good time for Gazelle because whenever there's new iPhones, and I'm sure we're going to see new iPads uh, soon, uh, it's just a great thing for Gazelle. Visit them right now, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot com, and get a quote you know, if you're thinking we're going to see new iPads this month, and I think we are, this would be a good time to say, well, I've got a third-generation iPad. In fact, I do. It's on at and It's a 64 gig. It's in good condition. What's that worth? 250 bucks. Now we're talking. Now that means that's their offer to you. That's how much they will pay you. And they will pay you to ship it to them. Their data experts will wipe off your data if you forget to do so. Often... What happens is they look at it and say, oh, no, you said it was good condition. This is much better. We're going to give you $280. This happens all the time because Gazelle is a great company. That's why over 600,000 people have been paid over $100 million for their old iPhones, their old iPads, their Samsungs, their Galaxies, their Nokias, their Black. Yes, they buy Blackberries, HTCs. They even buy uh, tablets. In fact, a much broader range of tablets now. They'll buy the Surface RT from Microsoft, the Samsung tablets. You got a Google Nexus 7 from last year. You want to get the new one? Get some cash for the old one. It's silly to let these gadgets, you know, gather dust in a drawer or your closet when you could sell them to Gazelle. Gazelle pays the postage on anything worth more than a dollar. They lock in your quote for 30 days, so it's safe. To, in fact, it's a good idea to go get a quote right now. If you think a new iPad is coming out, get that quote now before it does. Guarantee you it'll be a higher quote than after it comes out. 
And then you got 30 days to get the data over to try out the new, to buy the iPad, try it out, get the data moved over. Then you pull the trigger. They will send you a box with prepaid postage. You ship it back to them. And they will pay you by check if you wish. The fastest, of course, is PayPal. But here's the one that's the best, I think. If you buy stuff on Amazon, get that Amazon gift card. They'll bump the value by 5%. That's kind of a gazelle pro tip. Fast shipping, fast processing, great prices for all your used gadgets. Gazelle.com. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy, answering your questions, helping you understand technology to make the most of technology to figure out how to use it how to choose it, how to abuse it, how to lose it when you're done. That's what <laughs> the whole life cycle from beginning to end of a computer, of a laptop, of a tablet or a smartphone, your home theater system, that, that anything with a chip in it, anything with a chip in it, I would love to talk about with you. I, was, I just read an interesting article. How many of you, show of hands, remember typewriters? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody, when was, when was the, I mean, I used a typewriter in college. When was the end of typewriting? It was when personal computing kind of took over in the office and at home, probably the mid 80s, right? Certainly by the 90s. And uh, all of the great typewriter companies, they're, they're gone or they've moved on to other businesses. It's an interest, the only reason I ask, I just read an interesting article about typography on typewriters and two spaces after a period. Okay, now this is only for mom and dad, the folks who ever have used a typewriter. You come to the end of a sentence, you type a period, do you hit the space bar once or twice? This, believe it or not, is a hotly debated topic. <laughs> I think on computers, we pretty much do one space and move on, right? This is related to a little fight I had when my kid was in fourth grade or fifth grade with Henry's uh, teacher. Henry was using a word processor to do his, uh, his reports, which probably was part of the problem. I'm sure the teacher would have preferred he used his fine cursive style, of which Henry lacks entirely. Uh, but we were word processing. And uh, I was doing what I normally do when I write, which is I do not indent the, f the first line of a paragraph do you do that that is kind of the style but on, but it kind of went away with computers the same as a uh, two spaces after period the indentation first line of a paragraph you would indent right uh, but nobody does that anymore because computers you don't need to or something I don't know with <laughs> you put an extra line between paragraphs that's enough and I think the two spaces is the same thing Anyway, the teacher got mad at Henry. I felt bad. He, she said, no, Henry, you're supposed to indent paragraphs. And I thought, well, you just are really old-fashioned because no one does that anymore. And now, if you look around, look on the web. I mean, they, I guess they still do it in books. Here's a book that was printed in the 80s. Yeah, they still do it in books. Well, wait a minute, do they? Yeah, just a little bit. But uh, if you look on any website, nobody indents the first line of a paragraph on a website. Nor do they put two spaces after a period. These are old-fashioned. Except that it, uh, it has nothing to do with typewriters. <laughs> At least according to uh, an article I just read. This goes way, way back. Grammar Girl. I remember, you know, have you, do you do follow Grammar Girl, the Grammar Girl podcast? Quickanddirtytips.com. Um, she wrote a whole piece on this in which she said, you know, this is... This is what happened. This is the old way. Here's the deal, she writes. Most typewriter fonts are monospaced. That means every character takes up the same amount of space. So an I is just as big as an M, even though in fancy typesetting, an M is wide and I is narrow, right? So, for example, when using a monospaced type where everything is the same width, it makes sense to type two spaces after a period at the end of the sentence to create a visual break. So for that reason, says Grammar Girl, People who learned to type on a typewriter were taught to put two spaces after a period at the end of a sentence. That's the old way. But we don't use typewriters anymore, and now we are no longer using monospaced typefaces, right? We use proportional fonts where the M takes up more space than an I. It just looks nicer. And when you see stuff on the web, when you see stuff on the printed page, that's what it is. So that's Grammar Girl's explanation of why we don't 
do a double space. You know what? It's not true. Two spaces after a period goes way, way back. It uh, to the uh, to maybe even the 1600s. It's it's real, but actually, and she grammar girl has seen this piece because she talks about it. Uh, I personally think you should do whatever you want, <laughs> but you shouldn't get in trouble for it. So if you want to put two spaces after a period, even on a computer, go ahead. If you want to indent the first paragraph, you know, word processors have that capability. Did you even know that? Do you ever play with the ruler on your word processor? There's a special little doohickey. There's a name for it, and I don't know what it is off the top of my head, that you can bring in. So, you know, you have the little marks where the tabs are, and you have uh, the margins, the left and right margins. There's a special kind of tab that is just for the first line of each paragraph that tells it, move it in a little bit for the first line. So that your computer can do that automatically. And you also don't need to do an extra blank line after a paragraph because your computer can do paragraph spacing. All word processors can do that. I don't think there's a setting. For, maybe there is. Is there a setting for two spaces after a period? Maybe there is. But I think it's just taste. It's just a matter of taste. You shouldn't get in, you shouldn't get in trouble. If you ask me, you shouldn't get in trouble if you want to do it either way. Do you still I'm curious, do you still type two spaces after a period? I'm looking at the comments on here. A lot of people say, no, definitely. <laughs> two spaces after a period. But I don't think I don't know if Grammar Girl uh let's see, if she uh, uh, attempts to Explain paragraph spacing. <laughs> what is that called for the first line of a paragraph? It feels like there should be a name. The grommet, I'm going to call that. Do you, do you have, do you use grommets? <laughs> I understand I'm overload, they, I'm overloading that word. It has another meaning. But it's kind of like a grommet on your shoe. Yeah, no, 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 I'm going to have to call Mignon. I'm going to have to call Minion Fogarty, Grammar Girl, and I'm going to have to find out. We're going to have to get to the bottom of this. You know, we should get her on the show. She's funny. She's <laughs> a lot of fun. Two spaces after periods, grommets at the beginning of paragraphs. What do you think? The lines are open. 88-88, ask Leo. You still say dial a phone, don't you? When's the last time you saw a phone with a dial? Huh? We still say, uh, well, there's a lot of phrases like that. There are, there are, uh, archaic they don't make sense and kids still kills kids still you know say it but they don't know why they say it what does your kid say dial the phone make a call i'm gonna send you a text <laughs> that's what they say i'm i'm i'll text you oh my goodness all right hour three of the tech guy show techguylabs.com is the place to go Go to the chat room. You can debate the pros and cons of the double space after a period or the grommet at the beginning. It feels like the right word, doesn't it? I think I, I don't I don't think it is, but I the grommet at the beginning of a paragraph. Pro or con, yay or nay. It is, of course, absolutely true. People will argue more viciously, more intently over the smallest things. The less important it is, the more people will have an opinion about it. Just ask. Two spaces after a period. See what your friends and family say. The Because <laughs> that is about as, as small a detail as, uh, as ever. And I think, I think probably a lot of kids don't even know. It's one, one space now, right? Who cares? You got all that fancy font kerning and spelling and stuff. And the word processor, it's all built in. All right, Heather Hammond is there, ready to uh, take your calls. Nathan is ready to play the music. I am ready to answer your questions. Are you ready to geek out? Let's let's get to it. By the way, Johnny Jet coming up at half past the hour. 33 and a third after the hour to help you with your travel needs or travel expert. Uh, Dick D. Bartolo, our gadget guy, in the last segment of the last hour. All ahead, full speed ahead. We are headed off into nerddom. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Heather Hammond. The Phone Ranger. Hi, Heather Hammond, the Phone Ranger. Hello. Hello. Who should I take next? How come we're talking like Darth Vader? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>
Let's go to New York again. Brooklyn, to be specific. The force is strong in Brooklyn. (laughs) I love Brooklyn. I like to go there and get bagels. (laughs) That's too bad we destroyed that planet, isn't it? Uh, Brian, well, who, what's his name? Uh, Chris. Chris in My Brooklyn. Dad. Hi, Chris. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thanks, Heather. Hi, uh, long-time fan of The View and the Twitter Network. Thank you. Rock, rock on, my friend. Uh, I have a question. Um, a relative, I have a relative who finds even the simplest point-and-shoot <laughs> camera too complicated. <laughs> And they have no interest in a smartphone or a tablet. So my question is, is there a point-and-shoot-like camera with the simplicity and quality of something like an iPhone? That's a great question. There used to be. uh, Kodak used to make really nice, easy-to-use cameras until they went belly up. Uh, they're out of that business now, unfortunately. They were That was kind of their claim to fame as we make cameras for the rest of us, you know. What is the easiest to use? You know, an iPod Touch... Are they comfortable with the iPhone? I mean, is that something they can no, use? You won't even get close to won't one. Won't touch it. Not interested. An iPod Touch, you know, is essentially, it's not a great camera, but it's essentially the same as an iPhone minus the phone stuff. What would be, uh, what would be the simplest digital camera you could get out there? The sad thing is there were lots of them. There was the flip cam, which did video and stills, and it was one big red button. Uh, but they went out of business. Too. <laughs> there seems to be a, a connection here. Make it easy to use, and uh, you'll be going out of business. Um, a lot of people in the chat room are saying the Canon Elf. I like these, but I do not think... I, I understand what you're saying, because I have relatives like this. There's some people who just, they're missing a gene, or they just, I don't know what. Right. But they don't, uh, anything that they have to... Twiddle, twiddle a dial and pick a setting, it's not going to happen. They want a, a phone a, or a, a camera that they pull out, they turn on, they press a button, they take a picture, and they turn it off. Exactly. Yeah. And now you can set them up to do that uh, with almost anything, but uh, I understand what you're saying. I really do. Um, so, uh, chat, Cabo Zone in the chat room says some of the basic Samsung cameras are very simple. You know, there's an interesting camera. <laughs> uh, this might be the answer, I don't know, that uh, Sony just came out with. Uh, oh, that thing you put on. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So uh, it's a it's an odd idea. In the viewfinder, though. It well, no, but that maybe make it too complicated. Because this, the, we're, we're talking about the uh, what is it? The Q Q one hundred and the yeah, the Q two fifty. I can't remember what the uh, the names of these are. They look just like the lens taken off the camera. Uh, and, and in fact, in many ways they are, but there is a push button to take a picture of it with it. Uh, and then there is, so there's the QX10, which is the one you'd get. It's 250 bucks. The, the Q100 is actually a pretty fancy uh, system, but, uh, but the $250 QX10 uh, is very simple. There is no viewfinder, but, but. Oh, yeah, maybe this is wrong for somebody who doesn't want to be a geek. There's, right, they're still going to need a smartphone or something. To, you don't actually. You can use it by itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you couldn't see what you're taking a picture of. What? Right. There's got to be an answer. You can get at the grocery store. You know, there's disposable digital cameras. I don't know if that's the answer. You know what? That might not be a bad idea. I, think, I don't see those so much around Brooklyn, but I can... Um, yeah, they still make them. Yeah. Uh, I think the big box stores sell them. Maybe uh, Walgreens. Yeah. Walgreens would probably sell them, yeah. And that's so simple. That's an Instamatic, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Uh, golly, I, I this is a very interesting question, and I, I used to have a very good answer, which was Kodak, and I don't anymore. Um, and if anybody in the chat room or anybody's listening wants to chime in on this, you can call us, uh, or I'll you know, the, go I'll to the, the show notes. Yeah, check the show notes. Go to the website. Um, and you can go there and comment, folks. Uh, here's one from G- DG Murdoch in our chat room. Crutchfield, which I don't normally recommend their stuff, does have a camera that they tout as, let's see. Well, I guess they're selling the Easy Share. Yeah, see, that's the problem. It's You can't buy it anymore. It's the Kodak. What else? Nikon's Coolpix S600. That's complicated. Yeah, that's what I think. Um Olympus makes some flip cam like cameras the, okay. uh, that you might want to take a look at. This is a pretty old uh, article from Crutchfield. Most of those are out of stock or gone. 
I, I wish there were a great answer to this. I just don't think there is a great answer. I think that even the most simple camera is, sounds too complicated for this person. It is. And yet there's no reason why it shouldn't be you just take it out, turn it on, take a picture, turn it off. That's fine. Yeah, but it inevitably ends up in some sort of creative blocking. I know. Sepia mode to turn Why are my that. pictures all sepia tone now? Yeah, I don't exactly. understand it. <sighs> I wish there were an answer. I think smartphones, uh, you know, one of the things Samsung does, which I love with their uh, Galaxy series, they have a simple uh, home, they call it. And uh, they make, and I, I did this with my mom. My mom's, the problem is my mom is fairly technically literate. She has an iPad, she has a laptop, she has a desktop. Uh, but she'd never had a smartphone. So I gave her a Galaxy Note 2, put the home mode in simple. And I put on the front screen, just there's like four big icons. There's a camera icon. And it's pretty easy for her to use. She, I mean, she can do it. Um, I, I, uh, people are saying the power shot N. Um, but, but I think the real problem with these is... Uh, we got a bunch of geeks in the chat room, and they think everything's easy to use. A real person may not. The HP might be the closest thing, frankly, to uh, the old can uh, Kodak uh, point and shoots. Ninety-five bucks for the Photo Smart M627. It's about as simple as you can get, and it's cheap, which is nice. Seven megapixels, so it's not, you know, it's a decent camera. Um, you probably should take this person to the drugstore and say well look at this see if you can <laughs> figure this out uh what do we do what do, you know wasn't there a promise at some point that we were going to get so sophisticated with technology that anybody be able to use it you'd be able to sit down at the computer and you know write a novel or you take a camera and take beautiful pictures and i think they've really let us down in a way it is not that easy. It never will be, probably. It's you know, it's like saying, oh, I sat down at the piano, I played a sonata. No, you gotta learn. Not Justin in our chat room says the cyber shots, the Sony cyber shots have an easy mode. Those are good cameras, too. He says his mom loves it. Sony cyber shot in easy mode might be a good choice. Power shot and has no buttons, it's all touch screen. See, to me, that's not easy. The the easy is a one physical button. When you take a picture <laughs> and, it, and you push the button and it goes click, I took a picture. Let's take another one. Click. That's it. And then you give the camera to your son and say, do some, make prints. <laughs> I have a family member. I'm not going to name names. That's exactly what she does. She brings the whole camera to the one hour photo. She says, make me prints. You're a prince. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls right after this. <laughs> I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. He is Johnny Jet, the travel guy. JohnnyJet.com. He helps us uh, travel better through technology. Hey, Johnny. How you doing, Leo? Do you, We talked last uh, week about uh, better ways to sleep on the plane, and you look. You always look fresh and rested. Do you, ha do you have any issues with jet lag? Uh, my nickname is Johnny Jetlag. Because you travel, how many, 150,000 miles a year. And Over. You must be in many different time zones. I, I, Somebody once told me it's easier going west than east. I don't know. Have you experienced that? It is, except when you're going to Asia <laughs> or Australia, when you're going from the from the U.S. Because I wake up there always, every every time at 2 o'clock in the morning. So, yeah, but, I hate but that. The, you know, you know what I've learned? Everyone's different. Everyone's body is different. So I learned when you wake up in the middle of the night, just go with the flow. If you have work to do, get up and do your work for a few hours instead of staring at the ceiling. Don't you're fight not gonna it. Be able to fall. Okay. Don't fight it. Go with it. And then take another nap right before like seven, 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning for a couple hours. But what I try to do, like let's say I land in Australia or Europe or whatever, and it's in the morning, which makes it more difficult because you have to stay awake the whole day. You know, I, I try and take a nap outside if it's during the summertime, like literally on a park bench. So I only sleep for 10 minutes. The worst is if you go somewhere where it's cold and it's raining out and you yeah. don't want to do anything and you get yeah. under the covers, then you're done. You, you, you have to fight yeah, it. Yeah. You don't want to sleep during the day because you'll for sure be up at night. The sun is the kryptonite is kryptonite for jet lag. So you got to try and get, get as much sun. sun as you can yeah. and, and, and try and stay awake till at least 10 or 11 o'clock p.m. local time. And that way you should be good. 
I notice as I get older, I just don't have the ability to fight it off I used to. And so I just plan, you know, I know I'm going to have a day or two when I'm just kind of groggy and not sleeping very well. But by the third or fourth day, I usually feel all right. You know, and also if you have important meetings, try and go in early. Don't just don't just get off the plane and go to the meeting. Yeah. You know, I set my clock the minute I get on the plane. I try to get on that time, you know, as exactly. quickly as I can. Exactly. I actually yeah. start before. Yeah, that's a good idea. So I'm I'm going I'm going to the East Coast tomorrow. So what I'm doing, you know, I'll go to bed at eight o'clock tonight here ah, in, in L.A., which is eleven o'clock East Coast. Right. That way, I, I start adjusting, and I You've wake up at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And I actually try to book very early morning flights when I fly to the East Coast, because like a six o'clock flight is really early for here, but it's really nine o'clock on the East Coast, uh -huh. so it forces you to get on that time zone. Uh huh. So I like that. You have some websites for us this I week. I do. So I have a I have a new app. Vonage. I'm sure you know Vonage Mobile. I do know Vonage. I was a Vonage you, customer for years. It's voice over the internet. One of the first. Yes. So I've been a customer for a long time too, but they just came out with an app for Android and an iPhone. And it's a free download. So what I like about it, have you downloaded it by the way? No, I have to try it. Okay, so you can make free high def calls and send free text to anyone who has the app worldwide. So that's a good idea. And then if they don't have the app, they, they say their prices are 30% cheaper than Skype. I love Skype. Right. I mean, Skype, right. Skype's changed the world. Right. But they're supposed to be 30% cheaper. And it, I just love it because, you know, you can make free high – I mean, it's, it's, um, it's unfathomable to me because – I grew up in an age where when I traveled internationally, I couldn't call home because it was too expensive. Right. And it still now is you, if you don't plan for it. It is. Yeah. So so what, so what? if you're using your smartphone, the tip is just to use Wi-Fi. And to make sure that you're using Wi-Fi is to pull your SIM card out. <laughs> That'll do it. That way there's no chance of you forgetting to change the settings. <laughs> right. Pull, most pull phones the SIM card now, out just use Wi-Fi. Most phones now by default have internet. What, what you – should turn off is international data roaming or sometimes they just call it data roaming and most phones have that turned off by default they won't be doing data internationally unless you say yes explicitly yes i want you to do data roaming but so make well, sure that's turned off but pulling the same yeah that'll work <laughs> you wouldn't get any phone calls though that's the problem it's, but you don't need them i uh, plus who, i, I figure if somebody if there's night. an emergency back home i want them to be able to reach me no, what you tell them is where you are. Tell them the, tell them, uh, tell them the tell them phone the number of the hotel or your friend's house, wherever you're there staying. You you that go. way they call the home number because you're going to get some caller who has no idea where you are oh, and they're going to wake me. up in the middle of the night. Middle of the night. Hey, I Leo, you want to go to now. dinner? I'm in Italy. I'm in the middle of the night. Go away. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, that happens all the time. <laughs> and actually, another quick tip for a good how to sleep well is to make sure you check the alarm clock in the hotel. Because the person before you could have had it set for 4 o'clock in the morning to get up early, and the how, maids never never change it. How many times has that happened to me that the alarm clock goes off in the middle of the freaking night? It drives me nuts. I kick myself every time. I'm like, why don't I listen to my own tips? <laughs> <laughs> you know, a smartphone is a great thing to have, though. It really transformed traveling for me. The, the, you know, listen to this. Watch this. This is, a, this is a, a, the Moto X phone that you could talk to. Okay, Google now. How do I say, where's the nearest drugstore in Italian? And it will actually say it in Italian in a second here. It's kind of amazing. And what is that app? It's no app. It's Google. It's on the phone. It does it. Most Google phones will do this now. They'll literally say it out loud. So, And if they don't, because I checked in Turkish, it doesn't say it out loud, and I'm going to Turkey. But you could show the Turkish person that, that thing here. Weren't that is amazing. That, weren't you the one that told me that travel is getting so easy for people and you're upset about it? It's too easy. I never get and lost like, anymore. Like I was wandering know. around in Paris. I had no idea where I was. I fired up Google. And this is why you want an international data plan, by the way. Fired up Google Maps. I said, where's my hotel? It walked me home. <laughs> That's nice. I could say, I could say, because currencies always drive me crazy. Okay, Google now. How much is $300 in euros? <laughs> 450. Oh, you're good. Let's see if no, it's good. It's, no, it's not. No, it's not. Four, four tenths. 300 four US dollars equals 225 euros and 51 cents. Oh, sorry. You were going the wrong direction, yeah, Johnny Jet. Totally wrong direction. That's why you ask Google, because you could have paid a lot more for oh, that dinner. Oh, my God. What a fool I am. <laughs> well, and I didn't know, but Turkey doesn't use the euro, so I had to say, okay, Google now, 
What is the currency in Turkey? And it knows. It's amazing. Actually, I just confused it because it's going to get everything I just said. Yeah, see, it did because I said it's also got what is the currency in Turkey? And it knows it's amazing. <laughs> You have to shut up when you're telling. But I, I really do think a smartphone is a huge advantage. But it makes, it you makes cannot, it you've got to plan for it because if you just use your data roaming, you'll come back with a $10,000 bill. I'm bills. telling you, my wife and I were in Norway. Her bill for the week was $1,400. My bill was $20 because I'm grandfathered into a T-Mobile BlackBerry plan. Oh, that's terrible. I've already called at and I said I want 800 megabytes. Uh, that's not cheap. It's a couple hundred bucks. But at least I know I'll have data and I won't get lost as I wander. To, and you can get lost in Venice. Easy. Will they let you know what your um, balance is Yep. along the way Yep. when you you're getting that. low? Don't. Oh, that's another tip. Don't trust the phone. The phone's never right. At least that's what AT&T told me. You want to use. You want to have a My AT&T app or something like that and check it every night in the uh, hotel when you're using Wi-Fi. Okay. Good to know. Okay, you said you had two. Go ahead. Give me the other one. Okay, got one more. Let me find it real quick. I've been looking at you. <laughs> Don't look at um, me. <laughs> All right, here's a quick one. Yeah. So it's it's whatplug.info. Oh, so I need this. I'm going to Ireland in a couple of days. Actually, next week, I think. And uh, they're like, one of my buddies like, you know, it's it's much different in Ireland than it is in the UK. I'm like, really? But what plug do I use? This is so, so smart. So it knows where you are already. And then you just put, you put in where you're going and it tells you exactly what type of plug you need and adapter. Oh. So put in Turkey or wherever you're going. Oh, this is good. Right. And then, you, you know, uh, the other thing to pay attention, there's two things to pay attention to. One is the voltage. The other is the plug. Most laptop computers, smartphones will handle different voltages. So all you'll need is an adapter. Correct. But uh, so I'm in the United States and I'm going to Turkey. What does Turkey use? It's probably doesn't. Yeah, see, it doesn't look like it's a plug type C, a plug type F, an outlet type C, or an outlet type F. You got to buy it. That's like the, uh, that's, all the European ones are like that. They're kind of weird, though. They got all sorts of levers and knobs and they're confusing. Johnny Jet, JohnnyJet.com. Thank you, sir. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Happy travels. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You are, well, you know who you are. And perhaps you, like many are confused by computer technology. That's what I'm here to do to help you understand the digital world. Uh, we have more calls on the line. Thank you all for calling, by the way. Really appreciate it. Kind of hard to do a show without calls. R Richard is in West L.A., our next caller. Hi, Richard. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Good to talk. Mm. I bought the new um, uh, Nexus 7, and I've been having trouble when I tap uh, certain links and even some apps they don't launch. Yeah. I have to do it several times and finally turn my finger around and use my nail on my finger. Yes. This is so we were just talking about the Nexus 7 last hour. Yeah. Erratic touchscreen and, and keyboard problems. Google has acknowledged this as a problem. Uh, I believe it is, uh, there are touchscreen issues. I also believe that there are updates coming out, or if they haven't already come out, will be coming out uh, soon. Make sure you do the update. Yeah, um, I just saw an update. Was it to four point three? Yeah, that's I, that came right away, right? I yeah. mean, that's that's one of the first things you update to. Um, I'm looking at threads on Google Groups about this. Um, I I guess the the thing to do if if the, you've got all the updates on it and it's still doing this, is return it, is to say it's messed up. Um, because mine doesn't do this. I have no problem with clicking. Mm. Uh, and uh, as I said, Lisa's got one, she doesn't. But Google Google has acknowledged there are some issues uh, going on. I'm looking at an article from, um, this is from August 15th. Nexus 7 buyers report more defects as Google investigates complaints. I, I would guess that if you haven't got an update, uh, you will get one soon. The issue is going to be uh, if it's a hardware issue, you know, there may actually be something wrong with the, the digitizer and the touch screen, and that no software can fix. Right. Google says right now that uh, you should reboot the device in safe mode and or reset it to factory settings and see if that fixes it. Huh. So uh, I would try doing that. Uh, How that's do you do it in safe mode? I've never beats me. I don't know. Uh, 
<laughs> I bet you could Google that. Yeah, uh, I'm, I don't. I have no idea. I never. Even, I didn't even know there was a safe mode. Yeah, I certainly didn't know. <laughs> next, let me. Nexus Seven Safe Mode. You probably, I would guess, have to hold down. Um, uh, you know, like the volume down key or something. Let me see. Reboot to safe mode. This is good. I, I should know this. Uh, ensure your device's screen is on. Then press and hold the power button. Touch and hold the power off option in the dialog box. Touch OK in the following dialog to start safe mode. So I guess what it is is you, you're you starting to turn it off, uh, but then you, there's a dialog that you can launch to get into safe mode. Safe mode. Yeah. Okay, I'll give that a try. Yeah, try that. I mean, I called them, by the way, about this, and unfortunately I got someone who was, seemed like he just reported for work that day because yeah. he didn't know what I was No idea, about. yeah. Mm. Well, and you know, this is a problem in general with Google. They're not known for support. In fact, we often joke about uh, Google support coming from a, a programming language script because they don't they don't seem to even have humans sometimes. In this case, they're selling hardware. They ought to know how to do that uh, and help you. The problem is it's a two hundred twenty nine dollar device, so you're not going to get a huge amount of uh, support out of it. I do think it, it, you can make it better. Uh, I would try the safe mode. Um, and see, and if not, look for an update. And if failing that, you should just you should return it. They should fix it. Uh, volume down, power on, with no AC plugged in for Nexus Seven. I've done that. That's the recovery mode. That might not be a bad uh, idea. I bought a 32 gig version, and uh, Doctor Mom in our chat room says that this seems to be more common in the less expensive 16 gig versions. So maybe I, you know, maybe it's a hardware. I would guess hardware manufacturing error. Don't know. Anyway, I hope I hope you get that solved because it is a great device. I mean, at least you didn't. I guess you didn't pay a lot for it. So, but you you deserve more for two hundred twenty nine bucks than a than something that's not real reliable. Google's got to fix this. Alex in uh, Edwards, Colorado. Hi, Alex. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi there. Thank you for taking my call. Thank you so much for calling. I really appreciate your help. Uh and he's gone. No, you still there? Hello. Got really quiet, didn't it? I see him on the board. Pick him up again. Or I probably did it with my elbow. Are you still there, Alex? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, oh, I'm good. Here. Sorry about that. No, no problem. <laughs> what can I do? So I, I get my elbow. I'm terrible. What can I do for you? Oh, okay. So um, I have a Nexus 4. I've been using it for about a year, uh, and it's been a nice phone. Uh, I switched from an iPhone, and I enjoyed the Nexus. I think it's a, a great phone. Mm -hmm. I was a little skeptical when it came out, and I have to apologize because I was saying, oh, I'm not crazy about the screen, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I, I know. I've been listening to your show. No, no, yeah, no LTE, blah, blah, blah. I was wrong. It's yeah. a great phone. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah, so I had a bit of a surprise a few days ago when I took it out of my pocket, and it said, uh, just welcome to your new Nexus phone. Oh, that's not good. Yeah. Exactly. And so I'm trying to figure out what is the best way to back up and restore a complete phone. I use the uh, basically your Google account. When you log back in, it lets you restore, but it didn't work all yeah, that You know, well. I don't know what the rules are for Google doing this properly because half the time I, I get a new Android phone every few months, right? Because I'm always testing new phones. Mm -hmm. Half the time I'll turn on the phone, log into my Google account, and it will restore all the apps I've ever downloaded. <laughs> it will set it all up. It goes, boom, I'm amazed. It gets on the Wi-Fi, everything. Half the time it does that. Half the time it has no idea. It just goes, yeah, okay, what else you want me to do? And I don't know what the rule is for this. Now, you know if you go in the settings, you probably have this. I think it might even be the default on Android phones. There's a backup and restore check mark. It says Absolutely. back yeah, yeah, back up my settings. Checked. Yeah, that was checked. And that was checked. It, it restored some things but not all and because i have a aftermarket launcher i have a nova launcher on it i use nova launcher too it's wonderful yeah, yeah i like it. it it gives me a little tweaks that i am used to and it didn't restore that and it didn't restore none of the shortcuts uh that come well you know, and there's another backup you need to do if you're using a third-party launcher like nova which i do it's one of the great things about android is you're not stuck with any particular screen interface uh, and Launcher is a wonderful one, um, but there is a backup setting for Launcher. So what I do is I actually, once I get the phone looking how I want it, mm -hmm. I can give you the tips because as, as I am an expert in getting a new phone and having it configured within, I could pretty much get it configured within half an hour with everything on it. So the first thing, one of the things I, I do is I back up 
my Nova launcher set up once I've got it right. And then I put that backup. It's normally in a f data folder on the phone. I put it in my Dropbox. Oh, okay. So then I have that. The other thing I recommend for future reference uh, is LastPass. LastPass saves all your passwords. Really useful tool. And LastPass has an Android keyboard. That means I wouldn't use it day to day, but when you're first setting up a phone, using the LastPass keyboard means you could just put input you know, all your passwords very quickly to log into your uh, accounts. So it's, the, the thing that takes the most time for me is going back to Twitter and Facebook and everybody logging into my accounts again. Yeah. Now, as for saving your apps, if Google's not doing it reliably, there are other apps that will do this. There's Helium, uh, which does not require root. Helium Backup, you can get that in the Play Store. And then if you have root, Titanium Backup, that really is the kind of the gold standard. That backs up everything. So is the titanium similar to, let's say, with an iPhone where you could back up into iTunes and then yeah. just put it into revert? In, uh, into sort of. Mode? The way iTunes sort of. does it, it backs it up as a single blob. That's the phone. It's almost yeah. an image. Exactly. Um, neither of the, uh, neither Helium nor Titanium do that. They back up every app separately, all the data settings for the apps separately. So okay. it's, uh, it, it's not quite as fast to restore, but you can be a little more granular in the way you restore. Uh, uh, there are other programs that do this. I think uh, Lookout also will allow you to back up. Uh, Helium's free. It's from uh, the folks uh, uh, who do Clockwork Mod, Koch. Um, I think it's a great solution, and it does not require root. Titanium does. So I would go to the, the Google Play Store and, uh, and install Helium. Helium. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And once you have a good backup, you put LastPass to back up all your passwords. You back up your Nova Launcher, your launcher settings. Um, then it, then literally, I mean, it takes me no time to get a phone uh, up and running in the way I like it, almost instantaneously. I wish I knew what the rules were, because Google, well, half the time Google does it right, and then half the time it doesn't, and I just don't know what the rules are. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly. like with everything of the Google, it seems opaque. It seems like they kind of know what's going on, but nobody else does. They don't give you a lot of choice either. No. It's kind of like you log in, and then it you hope you you hope it comes in. You hope right. for the best. I have to say, in general, the experience is great. If you keep your contacts in Google, if you keep your address book, uh, your your calendar, everything in Google, the experience is pretty impressive because you don't have... I mean, I remember the days when you get a new phone, you have to enter in all your numbers. That's crazy talk. Exactly. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hour three of the tech guy show. More of your calls to come. Dick D. Bartolo at the end of the hour with some wacky gadget. Uh, show uh, all ahead on the show. I just read an interest. You know, have you have you ever received a uh, emergency alert on your phone? I just got an Amber Alert the other day, and it was loud. It was. I mean, you really sit up and take notice. When did that happen? Is that something new? I noticed. You know, so when that was going off, I got a, uh, I got a, a, a notice afterwards. Would you like to leave these on? And uh, I can't, I mean, I, f I would feel guilty if I turn them off. I don't, I mean, there's nothing I can do about it. So it is, it is in the settings of all phones now. And I, I'm guessing this was mandated at some point by the government. And I don't know in my, um, let me see where it is on my, uh, I'm looking on my, uh, my Motorola X and see where it is. I can't even, it's a problem. You can't even, you know, where is it? Where would it be buried? Security? No. Anyway, somewhere there is a, a setting for emergency messages. Somewhere buried deep. It's probably like in the about phone section. Do you ever read that? Do you ever go there? No, no one does. Is it in here? No. So there are a couple of different kinds of alerts. In the, uh, it's in the, on the iPhone. It's in settings notification center. It's, I'm a, which makes sense, but I don't know where it is in an Android. Do you know, John? Notifications, yeah, because that's that makes sense. Uh, I have no idea where they put. Anyway, uh, this is, I guess, something new. They, uh, you can get emergency alerts f issued by the National Weather Service. You can get amber alerts. You even can get, and I think you can't turn these off. You can get governmental alerts, like a big deal. Government, like you know, we are under nuclear attack. I guess I don't know. What are the what are the settings on the iPhone? Let me look here, John. 
You got amber and emergency. You see, it doesn't it doesn't really break it down there, but really, there's all different kinds. Now, you probably you can turn them off, right? Yeah, probably you don't want to turn off the flash flood warning alerts. But I just read an article. The reason this came up for me is I just read an article by Erica Sadoon, who is a, a good friend and a programmer, computer geek. She writes for the unofficial Apple weblog, tuaw.com. And she said, she calls it crying wolf when emergency alerts stop being affected. effective. She says, yesterday I switched off all amber and emergency iPhone alerts following a day and night of flash flood warnings that started at 1 a.m. and continued until noon. Now, of course, she lives in Colorado where they had those big flash floods. That's when this was written. She counted uh, in that 12-hour period eight individual emergency alerts, one right after another, in the middle of the night, in appointments. They, you can't disable them unless you disable entirely. And they say, flash flood warning, this area until 12 p.m., Flash flood warning. This area until 10, 15 a.m. Avoid flood areas. Check local media alert. Flash flood warning. This area until 9 a.m. And I think she makes a good point. I think this is great. And I, 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 it's a great use of a smartphone. You know, instead of a, what we, we used to have, what, a siren on the fire department, right? The noon whistle. But uh, if you ever heard it, it'd go off any other time. You'd know something was bad. I guess where there's volunteer fire and they'd run to the station. But uh, I remember when I was a kid, we actually considered that the atomic alert, that we were going to be atomic bombed whistle. would do duck and cover. Like, that's going to help. You're under a, a school desk. Um, I don't think kids know even what that whistle is anymore. Oh, it's the noon whistle. I set my clock to it. Or what What? what, what an emergency broadcast alert on, on, on the radio or the TV. The problem is... I would bet at any given time, you know, no more than a quarter of the population's watching the TV or listening to the radio. So it makes sense. Everybody's got smartphones. It makes sense to put these alerts on there. I don't know about Amber Alerts. I guess it's true that if you can catch somebody kidnapping a kid right away, you know, you can act immediately. You can catch them. Um, but they're very loud. I don't know if you've ever had that. She says, since AT&T pushed out its emergency alert upgrade to support my 4S I received alerts for a variety of weather situations, plus an abduction in California. Oh, yeah, that's right, that, that, that horrible guy. I can't point to a single alert in my history that I considered necessary to receive on a phone rather than seeing on TV or by hearing local tornado alarms. I cannot customize the alerts I hear, and I think maybe that's the problem. It would be nice if they were a little more granular. You could say, well... You know, don't don't fire the awooga horn if it's uh, if it's not you know something I have to do something about right now. But it's just on or off. She says these alerts are loud, scary, intrusive, and blunt. I think my alert burnout is pretty human. When people get tired of alerts that aren't relevant, they're gonna shut them off. We know that, don't we? Microsoft learned that with their their security warnings, their user. Uh, their UAC warnings, where it, it, if it bugs you too much, you just go, yeah, okay, 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 and you don't read it. So it has no effect. It has the reverse impact. You just get numb. She says, emergency alerts by their very nature should be few, important, and effective as it is. They become a spam, <laughs> the spam of disaster preparedness. And she says, I've just sent mine in my virtual alert spam folder. I guess that uh, I f it feels like a dangerous thing to do, or at the very least an unpatriotic thing to do, but I completely understand why. She got eight alerts in 12 hours? That's terrible. But I don't know what the answer is. I'm pretty sure these emergency alerts are government mandated. Let me see. I don't, I don't think they just appeared all of a sudden. In fact, I have a friend, a programmer, who was invited or asked by the government some years ago to work on a system like this. Ready.gov. Let's see what ready.gov has to say. Emergency alerts. You can receive important life-saving alerts no matter where you are, at home, at school, at work, asleep, at a meeting. Uh, uh, wireless emergency alerts, free inter-informational text messages to WEA, wireless emergency alert-enabled cell phones. 
within range of an imminent and dangerous local situation, severe weather event, or amber emergency. It's the CTIA, the Wireless Association, that's mandated this. I guess it's not governmentally required. But who's going to not do it, right? That's unpatriotic. Maybe even dangerous. You get sued if you don't put these things on here. Here's the wireless emergency alert PSA. Let's see. Here you, we'll probably hear, hear the sound. Here's to the things that can keep us safe. Those we use all the time safe with hardly a thought. Belts, fire extinguishers. Those that are silently standing by to save our lives. And now, traffic lights. those that we carry with us everywhere we go. Smartphones. That's a Windows phone. That's the sound. Many devices will now bring you That's wireless emergency alerts. It's louder than that. information directly from local sources you know and trust. With the unique sound and vibration, you'll be in the know wherever you are. Ready.gov slash alerts. Uh, I... <laughs> I would probably be wrong of me to say turn those off. Make sure they're turned on, right? You want to know when to go to the storm tunnel, storm cellar. But on the other hand, maybe I, Erica's got a little bit on her side. Maybe you shouldn't send too many of them. We do this. Every radio station does this. If you listen to the radio, you're good. I guess if you... Okay, I got it. I figured it out. Just keep listening to the radio. Turn it off on your phone. Listen to the radio. We'll let you know if there's anything to worry about. You can relax. No big loud alarms. Well, unless we really need to get your attention. They see, radio's perfect. Who needs this cell phone thing? <laughs> 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the number. Let's get... Uh, I got an email from somebody at FEMA. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And you are, well, you know who you are, but let's find out. Let's say hello. Let's, uh, who should I, who should I uh, browbeat with my brains next, Heather Hammond? <laughs> George in London. <laughs> Where, this is England Day. Yeah. I love it. Hi, George, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi there. Hi, Leo. Hi. Is this, is this a George that I know? I know some Georges in London. Um, no, you're I'm not baby, not good. baby George. You know, I had a bet, by the way, that George. that that would be the name of uh, Kate and uh, William's uh, son would be George because that was their great grandfather, right? Or the, yeah, no, their grand, their, yeah, great name. yeah, it's a great name. I thought there should be a new King George, so let's have George. And I, I should have made a bet. I should have gone to Ladbroke and uh, made a bet on that because I knew. Yeah, you could have made. <laughs> Now, now there's odds on who the new CEO will be at Microsoft. You do the bookmakers in England; they'll put odds up on anything, won't they? Yeah, yeah, they'll they'll take in bets on anything. Yeah. So there's, I think it's five to one odds that Nokia's CEO Stephen Elop will become the CEO at Microsoft. I think it's, I think it's a surety. So should, I should go bet, right? I'd make five pounds for every one pound I bet. Is that right? I don't understand uh, how yeah. it works. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, no, I, all right, George. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ask math questions. What can I what can I do for you? No, no. Um just well, I don't know if it's a simple question, but I've got one of these um interchangeable cameras uh, that take pictures in um, obviously in JPEG and all files. And um just wanna know what is the best software to use um to manipulate the raw files. Uh, whether it's paid or, right. or free software. And that. Windows or Mac, George? Mac well. You're on a Mac? I'm using a Mac. Yeah. yeah. So you already have a program that will handle those raw files. Raw, let me explain what raw is. Generally, raw is a pain in the butt, is what it is. Raw is <laughs> unprocessed, all the bits that hit the sensor. You know how a digital camera works. You've got a lens, traditional glass lens, just like any camera. But instead of film behind that, as there is on a film camera, there's a... Uh, a, a sensor made out of uh, complementary metal oxide silicone, and it picks up light and turns it into ones and zeros. It it's, it converts light into ones and zeros. Those sensors uh, then are attached to software. All cameras have it, which process it. They add color, for instance. The sensors don't know color, so they add color and things like that, uh, and then they save it down to your car. Now, normally, they also squeeze it quite a bit using something called JPEG, as you 
mentioned. Uh, that's a very common and very high quality form of compression. You can on all cameras say don't compress it quite so much. Bigger file size means better quality. Or compress it more. I want to get more pictures on a single card, but the quality will suffer a little bit from that. And professional photographers often choose no compression at all. They say don't process, don't process the bits. I want to see exactly one for one what that sensor saw. I'll do the processing myself. Now, without any processing, the Im the raw data does not look like a picture. It's black and white. It's you know it doesn't it looks funny. So even when you see the picture flash up on the LCD on your camera, that's a JPEG. That's been processed. So cameras are always creating JPEGs, at least a little thumbnail for you to see on the LCD. And then when you transfer the data over from your memory card to your computer. Before you can see a thumbnail, the program is going to have to understand the raw file format. And oh, by the way, every manufacturer has a different format. Thank you very much. Even, even the same manufacturer and different camera models may have different formats for their raw files. Thank you very much. So these, ca these programs have to understand the formats, apply processing of their own, and then put it up on the screen. But the beauty of this is everything's reversible. So if you say, well, that's too dark, or that's uh, the color's off on that, it's very easy to fix because you have the original data there. So you can modify what they do and then save it out as a JPEG. So uh, you've already got iPhoto, which will do it. If you want to go one step up, and I don't think it's a bad, I think it's a good idea for other reasons as well. Aperture is a great choice. It's only $80. It's on the App Store. Mm -hmm. uh, th that's very much like photo uh, I mean uh, iPhoto in fact has the uh, chief advantage of using the iPhoto file format so you can use both at the same time you import it into iPhoto open aperture it'll see the same pictures you don't have to do a separate you don't have to move the pictures or anything so if you're already using iPhoto aperture is a great choice I happen to like Lightroom which is Adobe's product it's more expensive it's about 200 bucks they update it more often aperture hasn't been updated since 2010 although it doesn't really need to be it's a pretty good program and I think, personally, you know, I use Lightroom, but I think Aperture is an excellent choice. It, it, and okay. I would, I would use that. Apple is always updating their raw importer. What may happen when you get a new camera is it may not understand it immediately, but within, you know, a month, they'll update their raw processing. You'll see this all the time. In fact, if you have updates turned on in your Mac, you'll see almost monthly updates that change the raw importer. That's why, because there's all these new file formats uh, from cameras as new cameras come out. Um, so are you getting pretty serious about your photography? Is that it? Um, yeah, get, getting there, yeah. I mean, obviously, I've, I've started taking a lot more pictures and want to make them. Um, yeah. So, if you're serious, you, you probably do want to shoot RAW and then use Aperture or Lightroom. Um, the reason people don't like RAW, the reason for friends of mine, Lisa, for instance, she said, turn, can you turn the RAW off on my camera? The file sizes are very large, and you can't really, you have to process them before you can really use them. You could take the default yeah, processing. that's what I've got the problem now. Yeah. Taking lots of raw file pictures. Right. So now everything's huge. To see them. Right. Everything's huge, and you got to go through each one and color correct it and fix it. So a lot of people just shoot JPEGs. There is, on many cameras, there's a nice feature that takes even more space where it shoots a raw plus a JPEG. And if you're using, for instance, an iPad, iPads cannot understand raw. So uh, you have to have a JPEG. The iPad will import uh, the JPEG sidecar, and leave the raw intact for later for you know aperture or okay. iPhone. So I you know I personally I like shooting raw with on stuff that really I want the best image quality. I know I'm gonna afterwards take some time, process it, fix it, clean it, print it, whatever. Uh, I'm glad then that I got raw. But frankly, most of the time, most people should just be shooting JPEG. I know professional photographers. I'm trying to remember who it was was it Tamara Lackey? She's a very famous child portrait photographer. Shoots JPEG. She said, I don't, I don't need RAW. The cameras are so good in their JPEG processing. They do such a good job that you probably don't need it. You know, doing shooting RAW is probably uh, overboard. And as Dr. Mom says in our chat room, when I shoot RAW, I get, I get chilly. Not in the RAW, Dr. Mom. We're talking about something completely different. Hey, it's nice to know you're listening in London. I appreciate it, George. Keep listening. Uh, we're going to keep taking your calls in just a little bit. Every time I mention something like Aperture and Lightroom. By the way, Lightroom, I'm told now, is less expensive. Adobe dropped the price to 129 bucks. That's good. That's to stay competitive with Aperture, obviously. 
Uh, but anytime I mention something like that, you can get links, more information, and add your two cents if you're a photographer and you've got a better choice. At the website, techguylabs.com. And, uh, you know, James Ruvo's writing as I speak to get all the notes up there. And then uh, Josh Windish will come in and he'll add audio and video so you can listen to each question, listen to my answer, or watch it. And then please add your thoughts in the comments. We always welcome them. Techguylabs.com. I am Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. More of your calls right after this. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. And uh, we're going back to the phones here. Let's see who's next. How about... Brian in Asheville, North Carolina. Hi, Brian. Hey, Leo. What uh, what a real treat! The last time I got to ask you a question, you were it was the screensavers. What? <laughs> That's a, a little while ago. It a was little a while, while ago. It was screensavers ended in two thousand four. So uh, you know, it's good. You call me every nine years. I think that's right. <laughs> well, thank you. It's nice to talk. Nice to talk to you, and thanks for listening. I appreciate it. I uh, always do. Thank you. Um, uh, my question is the the, the iPhone, the, the low-cost iPhone. There's a lot of talk about this low-cost iPhone, the plastic back, low-cost uh, The 5C, iPhone, yes. C, yeah, C yeah. for cheap? No. C, no. C <laughs> for color. It's actually not that cheap. Um, here's what Apple – I really think this is why Apple did all this. Um for, until these new phones came out, they were selling uh, free or inexpensive iPhone 4s and 4Ss, pretty old iPhones. Uh, and so I think that what they what they didn't like is the fragmentation that provided in the marketplace. It means there, were, there are a lot of people with iPhone 4s and 4Ss, new ones. So they, they wanted to have a less expensive phone that they got offer people who were price sensitive, but that had the capabilities of the iPhone 5. So that's what the 5C is. It is an iPhone 5. doesn't have the fingerprint reader, but it is an iPhone 5. And most importantly, will run all the software that the iPhone 5 will run. So now they've eliminated fragmentation in the marketplace. They're, everybody's Everybody who's buying a new iPhone is getting at least an iPhone 5. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, why it, it seems to me that the average consumer, yeah, that's, you know, they're 150. Sometimes you can get an, uh, an iPhone 5 for $100. No, and, 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 and I say this a lot. Uh, in the U.S., there it's kind of meaningless what you pay for a phone up front. People pay a lot of attention to that, but that's because of psychology. Purely rational <laughs> calculations will tell you the cost of the phone is not the $100, the $50, the $200, sometimes the $300 you pay up front. That is a small fraction, less than 10% of the total cost of the phone over the two years you're going to be using that phone because the phone companies, when they subsidize a $200 phone, they lock you in for two years, and they're usually 80 or 50 60 70 $80 a month for data plans. So most phones cost a, th a couple of thousand dollars. So the upfront, the down, is a down payment is a small amount. Um, but, but Apple is an international company, a global company, so they have to also consider the unsubsidized cost of a phone because when you buy a phone in many other countries, you don't get that subsidy. That's a U.S. thing. You buy the phone outright. And so they, they, they really – and an iPhone, a 5C is – a 5S is uh, I think $650, $700 up front. Now, that's a lot of money. And in a lot of countries, that's uh, enough to stop people from buying it. Gotcha. So, hey, thanks for taking my call. That's the rationale. Hey, I really appreciate your helping me out, Brian. I, I thank you for calling. Nice to talk to you again. I'll talk to you next uh, decade. <laughs> well, let me do some calculations. I think a 20, 2022 will be. Uh, <laughs> is that possible? Nine years from now is 2022? We live in the future. Hard to believe. I don't think I'll be around. You better call me sooner than that. <laughs> Is that right? 2013 plus 9 is 2022. I feel like we're living in a Zager and Evans song. In the year 2222, oh. if man is still alive, if will woman will cast? survive, will they have an iPhone 10? Oh, my God. It'll be iPhone. You're still rocking your iPhone, what, 4S, right? Yeah. 4? Mm -hmm. 4S. Do you feel... So you're due... It's been two years, right? You're so funny. You you feeling the? Are you ready? And we're talking. I'm feeling Heather. the weight of the. Do you want to get a new one? Yeah. Not at all. I drive things into the ground. Good for you. 
You've seen my laptop. It's actually kind of the opposite <laughs> because, you know, people who keep buying stuff are driving stuff in the landfill. You're not driving things into the ground. Thank you. You're keeping exactly. them out of the ground. But I think that's probably smart, yeah. I was at a bicycle store one time, and the guy's like, just get a new one. I'm like, no. and then do what with this hunk of metal? Right. <laughs> See, I'm kind of, I'm ruining it, though, because you're all the good you're doing, I'm completely reversing by getting a new phone every couple of months. Yeah. I, I think just... I'm going to give you, I am going to, here's what I'm going to do. Uh-oh. Are you, have you been drinking? <laughs> Don't get all... Just this fine Dunkin' Donuts coffee, that's all. <laughs> uh, I am going to give you my old iPhone 5. I don't need it. Shut up. I got the new one. What do I need that for anymore? You should have a 5. Oh, but then what will I do with my old one? Oh, see, there's a problem. <laughs> Never mind, you can't have it. Bye. <laughs> Whew, I'm off the hook. Jim in L.A., Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, <laughs> Jim. How you doing? Thanks, Leo, for taking my call. <laughs> Thank you for calling. I appreciate it. Um, I had a question. I'm looking into picking up a convertible um, laptop. So either one that will transform, spin it around, the screen right, to make it right. a, a tablet, or one that detaches the keyboard and it's a separate tablet. Yes, and there's got an ungodly number of those on the market all of a sudden. This right. You seem to be not alone. Do you, do you, you want a detachable tablet? Is that part of what you want? Yeah, it would help. It would be maybe more convenient mm -hmm. having my keys on the – when you spin it around, you know, having your fingers grafting onto the keys of the keyboard can be uncomfortable. So I'm concerned about that. So there's a couple that I really like. Um, there's the Lenovo Yoga. There's the Asus Transformer. Both of these are excellent. And Sony just introduced one that I think might be – the one for you and i've never seen anything so thin in my life it is absolutely gorgeous uh i think they just introduced this uh in uh, berlin at the ifa conference i think it's the duo is what they call it there's an 11 inch and a 13 inch it is the thinnest tablet i've ever seen you these are windows 8 right yes yeah it's the thinnest tablet i've ever seen um, runs Windows 8. It is touch, and I don't recommend getting Windows 8 without getting a touch screen. But of course, a tablet's going to be touch. They're gorgeous, by the way. They they have they call it triluminous. Um, it's 1080p, which I really like, and they have a real keyboard, like a real keyboard. The only negative on this, which snaps on, by the way, uh, right. it also has a stylus, which is great. Um, the re the only negative on it is the trackpad's a little skinsy. It's kind of a skinny little bar at the bottom instead of a full-size track bar. Uh -huh. uh, the other negative might be the price. They're over a thousand bucks, and you know I think anything really good is going to be. That's within our budget. Okay. Yeah, yeah I would. These are the they're, these are the thinnest Windows 8 uh, tablets out. There's nothing thinner than this. So does the does the keyboard in that have a separate battery so that when you're when it actually will extend, like say you got eight yes. hours or six yes. hours of yep. tablet. Yep. Okay. Uh, which gives you 10 hours with the with the keyboard. These are Haswell. By the way, do not buy anything that's not fourth generation Intel at this point. Okay. Battery life is 50% better on Haswell. Uh, they weigh two pounds. That's with the keyboard. Wow. Yeah. No, these are, this is, I haven't played with this yet. These just came out rel relatively recently. Um, I think these are totally gorgeous, and it's probably the one I would get. And, uh, you know, Sony... Uh, Quality control and so forth has been up and down in the past, but I think they've gotten pretty good. I, I, I have no hesitation in recommending it. The Duo from Sony. When Windows 8 first emerged, uh, there was, I guess understandably, a reluctance from a lot of these companies to put out laptops. They took the old Windows 7 laptops and reconfigured them. They didn't have touch. They weren't designed for Windows 8, which made a big difference. Even just, you know, simple things that uh, Windows 8 does differently weren't easy to do on them. But we are now seeing the next generation. Here it is, what, almost uh, eight months later of, of laptops. And, that, and Windows 8.1 uh, comes out, what, in two weeks? Uh, yeah, October 18th. So less than two weeks. So that's the other thing I would, I would uh, you know, you know, if you buy any Windows 8 machine now, it's going to be upgradable to Windows 8.1. So that's not a big deal. Um, but that's going to make a difference, too. I think, you know, things are turning around a little bit for Windows 8, i got to say. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More comes right after the loop. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. He is Dickie D, the gizwiz uh, at thegizwiz.biz. He joins us each and every week to talk about gadgets. He's, of course, if you say, oh, as I did, 
That's a familiar sounding name. Where have I heard Dick D. Bartolo before? He's one of the one of the usual gang idiots over there at that Mad Magazine on Madison Avenue, and has been formerly on Madison. Avenue. Oh, they're not there anymore. No, we're on Broadway. Oh, you're getting this. <laughs> moving up, moving on. We're up. moving up, yeah. So uh, Dick uh, is uh, you. You specialize in the parodies. I do. I yeah. do a lot of uh, in the current issue. I have a takeoff on the clear cast antenna. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that. No, I haven't. Co commercial where they, they, they make it sound like the government has demanded that television <laughs> HD signals must be made free to you. <laughs> but but their little antenna, Leo, is $100 oh. or 50 if you happen to live in these zip codes. <laughs> oh, so hey, I live in that zip code. I want to save yeah, exactly. 50 bucks. It, it, Exactly. And so in the satire, I say, if you happen to live in one of the 50 states, you're a lucky person <laughs> who can buy this antenna that is based on based on plans NASA uses to build the hangars astronauts use to hang up their spacesuit. <laughs> the reason I mention that is because, and we mentioned this last week, you're going to be uh, hosting... Uh, an evening of parody movies in the Turner yes, Classic a, Movies this yeah, week. Yeah, in, a, in a couple of days, yeah. October 9th, oh, Wednesday, yeah. uh, 5 p.m. your time, 8 p.m. Uh, our time. And, yeah, four movie satires. And before each one, I, I tell why I, I picked it. I'll just mention Murder by Death. I picked that because it's the closest to a mad magazine movie satire. You know, you could have written it. I could have written it. Easily. I could have written yeah. it. But I, it was, uh, it was a rip off. <laughs> I was ripped off. Uh, Dang it. But it's, it's great, great fun. Now, um, uh, uh, what else? Oh, last week we did, as seen on TV, two things yes. you should not buy. Yes. Now these are two things that I have had some luck with, and I'll tell you. <laughs> And believe me, for as seen on TV products, that's pretty good. It is. It is. Okay. I uh, I originally had bought Magic Mesh, which is the screen door with the magnets down it. You like so that. that? I did. And what I found, though, is during the summer, it started shredding. The magnets oh. fell out. So I bought a new one uh, called MagnaScreen. And I found MagnaScreen is better made. But... Uh, after about three weeks, those magnets started falling out. Oh, so what you have to do, seriously... You need to mesh the magic mesh with the magnet screen. <laughs> you have to just run a little piece of scotch tape or oh. glue the little plastic boxes. Everything is just snapped together. And uh, when, when uh, Dennis and I had our little uh, first anniversary uh, party... I can't tell you the number of people who kept walking through it going, I love this thing. I love oh, this thing. Neat. But Dennis had glued the little boxes that hold the magnets in places so everything stayed in place. And, and it worked fairly well. So Magna Screen uh, is, is pretty decent. The other one I, I like a lot, and it, it's because of the reviews that mine is still lasting, is Pocket Hose. Okay? <laughs> so... so Pocket I hose. saw your video on pocket hose. Yeah, po pocket hose, <laughs> it's a little misleading, a hose you can carry in your pocket. I don't think so. Because why empty, first of all, why would you want to? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, no. Exactly. I mean, does somebody ever come running up to you and say, Got a hose? Do you have a hose? Yes, I have it have one in my oh, pocket yeah, right here. Lucky you, lucky oh. you. I just have to care. What do you want? I have twenty five feet in my uh, right pocket and I have the fifty footer in my left I don't pocket. ever carry a hose in my pocket or ever wish I could. So it's it's a compressed hose that by golly, when you hook it up to the water pressure, it does expand into a fifty foot hose. Oh. Uh, when you unplug it, it does uh, start to decrease in size. You'll never, ever get it back in the package it came in. Well, because, that's always the case with this kind of thing, yeah. isn't it? Yes. Right? That you just they 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 act as if somehow it's going to magically just fold right back up into its exactly. Little, but yeah. it does fold up into a very manageable size. Oh, all right, and it's very lightweight. You mean after you let the water out, it kind of goes. Yes, yes. You know what? You could scare a child <laughs> badly just by saying, there's a snake in the yard, and I killed it, and look, oh, it's dead. It's, it's slowly Coming dying. Alive. And then you'll, you'll see it crinkle up again. But on the boat, 
it is very convenient because I, I use it to rinse out my engine after I make a trip. And dragging a hose over the top of the boat and hooking it to the engine is a drag. So I do use pocket hose. Ah. But I know from the reviews, you have to treat it gent. Don't step on it. <laughs> don't let it get caught under something. Don't use it. Don't try to fold it up. <laughs> don't bring it on your don't, boat. Don't use water in it. That I found was <laughs> the best thing. Whatever you do. Stay. <laughs> now, somebody in the chat room saying that this is, there's a cheap version and then there's a more expensive version that's a little more durable. Well, you know what? Someone told me the blue version is more durable. Okay. So I did order the blue version. I haven't gotten it yet. But my green version, I've had for about two months now. I've used it about five times, and it's still... But I, I really am gentle with it. The right. plastic fit, the fittings are just plastic. And if you do anything, like pull it under a chair or something, you're going to rip that coating, and I think it's going to leak. But... Um, it's, if you treat it gently, I like the way it works. And I like the fact that I can throw it down a hatch. It takes up no space. It weighs almost nothing. And, uh, it's down to, I think, what did it drop? It's, uh, it's under 18 bucks now. It right. started out at about 23. Now on your video, actually, I watched your video, youtube.com slash mad maddest, and you're demonstrating it. And actually that's really useful because it's a real life demonstration. So you get a sense of how, how it expands and, and also how small it gets when it goes back. Yeah. To its and then I'm using a thing I really like. And I think you ordered. That's one what too. I was going to say. The thing yeah. I got from the video wasn't the hose. It was the nozzle. I love that pocket nozzle. Pocket fireman. Uh, no, not pocket fireman. Just fireman's <laughs> nozzle. Yeah. It sounds like a yeah. porno show, doesn't it? <laughs> Is that your fireman's yeah, nozzle in your pocket? It's fireman's nozzle. But it's like or, you've yeah. seen the fire hoses where they have, it's got a lever and it's it looks strong and powerful. And so this was, I bought this because I, I just like the look of it. And in fact, it's a pretty good Yes, nozzle. Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned that because the the fireman's nozzle is not as powerful with pocket hose. So obviously the <laughs> diameter of the hose is not quite as strong as it is with a, a regular oh, hose. You do, I'm using such restraint here right now. I know, I know, I know. Oh, <laughs> my goodness, I just hold in my It's tongue. radio and <clears throat> you're... You're making a trip and you don't want to mess with it. This would be the last time to get in trouble with the FCC. I can just tell you yeah. that right now. No, but uh, you're right. You want a better hose when you're using the fireman's nozzle. You do, so that you can get the full pressure. Because the fireman's nozzle is really, you can uh, wa you wash can put it out a fire with it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, probably not recommended. Anyway, no, no, no. Um, but, and, and, uh, so uh, pocket hose comes 25 feet. 50 and 75 feet. Most popular uh, is the 50 foot. Uh, you know, if you're going to get a fireman's hose, you might as well get the biggest one you can get. Oh, no, wait a minute. Yeah, this, is not I, the no this is not the nozzle. This is the hose. The hose. Okay. The hose. Yeah. Okay. And the blue one's better than the green one for reasons yeah, no one understands. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Dickie D, Dick D. Bartolo. Go to gizwiz.biz. That's his website. All of the uh, gadgets he talks about on this show and on his podcast, The Gizwiz, and your appearances on ABC's World News Now and Craig Crossman's Computer America and all the other stuff that you do. It's all in his writings for uh, the uh, the boating magazine and uh, all of that's at gizwiz.biz. Oh, no, boating magazine has gone bye-bye. Oh, no. Did the magazine went, go bye-bye or did you go bye-bye? They went bankrupt and they went, no the, no, the magazine went out of business. It's a bad business to be in these days, print. Yeah, especially speed boats with, you know. They use a lot of know. gas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's sad. Well, anyway, gizwiz.biz, there is the What the Heck Is It contest, chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine, autographed by this guy here, Dick D. Bartolo. Uh, there'll be a close-up picture of a gadget. You have to identify it. Twelve autographed Mad Magazines for the right answer. Twenty-four for the best clever wrong answer. So everybody has a chance to win. You'll be uh, playing for, I guess, what, the January edition of Mad Magazine? You'll be playing for, uh, da, 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 yes, the January issue. Uh, oh, wait a second, December. December uh, because issue. Uh, the winners just got the October issue, okay. November, yeah, December issue. And uh, you have till the end of uh, the month to play that? October 31st. Dickie D, always a pleasure, my friend. Yes, sir. We'll see you yeah. next time. I'll and be here. For all the rest of you, thanks for joining me on the Gizwiz, I mean on the Tech Guy Show. <laughs> I'm observing your personality. Uh, we'll be back next time, and I hope you will too. And meanwhile, 
Have a great Geek Week, everybody. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the Tech Guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows and Windows Weekly, Macintosh and Mac Break Weekly, iPad and iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today and our weekly roundtable show This Week in Tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.